the next speaker, Alex Clark. Could you uh, share uh, your screen? Yes. From SKL, who will be talking about data infrastructure for open science. Okay, managing. Excellent. So Let's can you see? see? Yes. <clears throat> yes, it's still in uh, the default view. Okay. Hopefully that's full screen now. Yes, it looks good now. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Alex. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you today. I've thoroughly enjoyed all of the talks um, so far. Um, it's been really, uh, really great to hear the speakers and the discussion, discussions and the questions that have come up from everyone participating. Um, so um, I I'm an operations data scientist working at the SKA Observatory um, at Jodrell Bank in Manchester in the UK. Um, I work in the operations team. So I work with Rosie Bolton, who's head of data operations um, and a number of others in our team. Um, I'll give you a brief background on, on myself. So I did, uh, I did a PhD using the LOFAR telescope in the Netherlands, observing um, extra galactic uh, objects, radio galaxies, galaxy clusters, um, and then did a postdoc um, looking at machine learning and uh, looking at uh, classifying sources um, in bulk. So we're talking hundreds of millions of sources, um, uh, in particular using image and table data and how you can classify them using machine learning, because that um, becomes infeasible for humans to go through uh, that amount of data. Uh, and now I work at SKAO, and um, in our team, we're focused on um, pretty much as the title says, say, is building a, a data infrastructure um, for SKA observatory data products. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, what that means. <clears throat> and you will see that the themes of reproducibility um, are very strong throughout, throughout this. Um, so uh, yeah, this is just my, my outline. So uh, I'll give you an, a very quick overview of um, uh, SKA uh, and the sort of SKA data workflow. Um, and then in particular, I'm gonna talk about um, these things called SRCs, the SKA regional centers. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the things we've been doing, uh, namely science data challenges, um, and training events, as you'll see. So just a quick introduction. Um, probably many of you have heard of the SKA already, um, but this is what it's going to look like. Um, it's one observatory with two telescopes, one based in the Western Australian desert. That's the SKA low. So that's low frequency um, antennas, a lot of them. These are the most recent numbers. Um, they have been prone to changing a little bit, but the, these are up to date as of today. Um, and then SKA mid, um, that's looking at uh, your slightly higher frequencies. Um, and there's going to be hundreds of dishes in the South African desert. Um, and so those two, the, the challenge is, is having two telescopes that come under one observatory and having, um, having a way to manage that um, that data infrastructure so that users um, get the best experience from that. So these things called SKA regional centers, which maybe some of you have heard of, um, maybe not, but they're, they're gonna, really going to be the centerpiece for how users um, see the observatory. They're, they're going to be how the users uh, interact with the data um, and get science out of the SKA. So you probably have heard that the data rates from SKA are going to be um, pretty intense. And this slide hopefully uh, demonstrates that for you. And the challenge with having data rates that are so intense is that um, it becomes hard for, um, uh, to, for reproducibility and for openness in, in how you get to an end result from, from an initially vast amount of data. And the initial data rates 
are, are deleted uh, within sometimes 24 hours, sometimes a week at most, just because it's simply infeasible to keep that much data. And so this slide is, is split into two parts here. Um, on the left, I'm just gonna minimize that so I can see, yeah, on, on the left, um, you can see the data rates coming straight out of the, um, the infrastructure, the SKLO and SKA mid, you've got two petabytes a second coming out of SKLO. Um, and then you know, nine terabytes a second from the beamform data uh, on the sky. And then, yeah, this, is, this goes through correlation. Um, and then you, there's this thing called the science data processor. Um, and up to that stage, all of that from the science data processor to the left, but everything before the green arrow, um, the users will not see and will not have access to that data. Um, and in fact, that data will be deleted uh, as soon as as soon as the correlation is done, as soon as the data products are made. Um, so we're talking images or perhaps time series or perhaps um, even image cubes. Um, those are the data products that end up in the SKA regional centers. Um, and so users will not have access to the visibilities. They will not be able to remake that image um, simply because it's just infeasible <laughs> um, to keep that much data. As soon as, as, soon as um, you do an observation, the data flows through the pipelines here, um, through the science data processor, uh, data product is formed, and then all of that uh, raw data is then deleted so that another observation can take place. Um, it is simply infeasible to, to keep to keep that amount of data. And so you have this situation which is um, which astronomers I think typically would resist because they might feel uneasy um, that they get given a data product and uh, they can't go back to the very raw data and, and do their own tweaking. Um, so there's a challenge here in making sure that astronomers feel confident um, in the workflow. Uh, in, and, and, and how they can do their science. And so these little, um, these little people with lines through just here and here just demonstrate that the users cannot see and will not see that data product, but they'll see the specific data products that come to SKA regional centers. So SKA regional centers, they're gonna be basically a collaborative platform where users can access data they can process data in the cloud at those centers um, from anywhere in the world. So the, the idea is that these, these, these regional centers will be distributed. There'll be, let's say some in Europe, there'll be some in Australia, some in South Africa, some in China, et cetera. Um, however, data will not be mirrored at every site. Again, there's going to be, even, even with the final data products, it's too costly um, and too intensive to mirror data everywhere. And so you'll find there'll be particular data sets that are located at particular sites. And the challenge here is to have a system which allows users in uh, one part of the world to analyze and access data that's in another part of the world um, as if it was in front of them on their laptop. Um, because this, this methodology of working is very much users bringing their workflows and code to the data. And I think this is a paradigm shift that's happened in the last, uh, let's say 10 years. I think astronomers of the past would, the data would be small enough that they can just have it on their laptop and they can do, deploy everything on their, on their, local, um, their, their local machines. Um, and again, so that's, that's another, thing that's going to become infeasible with, with the size of the data products that are coming out of SKA. Um, so it's we're working very hard to try and make SRCs, these regional centers, um, a welcoming space where users feel confident in bringing their workflows and their code to the data in, in these sort of cloud compute infrastructures. Um, so a lot of tools have been mentioned in, in the previous talks, um, things like Jupyter Notebooks. We had some very nice demonstrations yesterday um, using things like Binder. I'm gonna talk about containers in just a few slides time. 
Um, and these are all ways where users can uh, uh, bring reproducible workflows to their data and that they can share it with their colleagues and they can then yeah, collaborate on that. Um, and I'm, I've got, a, yeah, so things like Jupyter Notebooks um, and then these ancillary, these, these data products that then come out, so they're images for papers or things like that. Those are the things which then they can download to their local, um, you know, their local laptop in preparation for writing up results and things like that. Um, so the exact mechanism of how this works is, is very much what we're exploring at the moment. Um, there, is, there are certain widespread technologies like Kubernetes, which is basically a container management system. Um, one specific example we're looking at exploring at the moment is something called Rusio, which is a data management system uh, used by, built by CERN uh, and used by uh, other um, infrastructures as well. Um, and, and Rusio is a way to, it's a data management system which allows data to be mirrored at different SRCs depending on demand. So data would come out of the telescope and then uh, Rusio would replicate that data set at specific SRCs as and when is defined and needed. Um, and there is opportunity for popular data sets to be moved around and moved to, uh, let's say there's a, uh, a specific working group working on a specific large uh, piece of data. There's opportunity for that data set to then be moved um, to the relevant SRC. Um, but yeah, just coming back to this point, you. <laughs> You have to rem remember that users will not have access to the raw data here. Um, so just a few numbers here, um, just to emphasize why I've said some of the things I have. So storing SKO data growing up to 700 petabytes each year will be a challenge. Um, this, this is millions of dollars per year in new data for one copy, which is, which is why I've sort of emphasized that, that there won't be data mirrored at everywhere around the world. Um, so yeah, we want to avoid unnecessary duplication um, and we want to create a, an infrastructure, a system where users feel welcomed and they feel that it's easy to, to go online and, and access a data set. And they don't even need to know where that data set is. They just need the, the user interface and the experience to be intuitive and to be um, reproducible, and they need to be confident in how to do that. Um, and that's that's a shift that I think astronomers are are starting to get used to, um, but we still have a little way to go with some of the tools uh, that I'll mention in a moment. So yeah, overall, these regional centers will do a number of things. That they're, they're going to be the host, the hub for SKO data. They're going to enable uh, analysis, notebooks, workflow execution. They're going to enable data discovery um, and exploration. They're going to support the scientific community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about training and, and services in uh, at the end of this talk. Um, they, they are basically the data management system for SKA data. Um, yeah, and then and then visualizations. Um, and distributed computing as well. So um, the, these SRCs will have significant compute resources behind them. So you will be able to do um, in significantly intensive sort of batch processing, um, the similar thought of sort of compute processes you would do on, on HPCs. Um, yeah. So that's sort of the, <clears throat> the environment that an SRC will, will be in. Um, so just a note on data discovery and reuse, and just thinking about previous telescopes that have gone through this, um, because all data, all SKA data products will in time become public. And um, so we can look at examples, particularly uh, I've highlighted by the Hubble telescope and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS. And if you look at what's happened with those telescopes, you'll see that um, legacy data products are a massive driver in science, uh, in results, in publications. Um, 
So you see that that plot on, on in the bottom right, the Hubble. You see the archival um, publications make up significant, if not the most, um, actually, yeah, the most publications. And then, and Sloan Digital Sky Survey is one of my favorite examples, um, just because I work with the data quite a lot. But if you go on their website and you and you look at how you think about how you feel when you go and you you click on data there and you explore how they um, give users access to data it's a very intuitive and very thought out experience um, and then just this note on publications in the bottom left here it's, it's one of the most cited surveys in the history of astronomy simply because of the the way that they've made their data accessible and they've made it um, clearly um, documented um, and yeah, you've got 10,000, I think it's now 11,000 peer reviewed publications, 600,000 citations. Um, so th these are the kind of examples we want to strive towards with SKA. We, we really want to make the, the experience intuitive and easy so that um, the, the major drivers of, of science um, from legacy data products uh, yeah, become easy. So I'm going to talk a little bit specifically now about reproducible reproducibility themes in the context of what I've just said. Um, and I'm, just one slide here on uh, containers, software containers. So some of you, I'm sure, know what software containers are, but just in case anyone is, is a bit rusty on what they mean, um, software container is, is an environment and two of the most popular ones are Docker and Singularity. Um, it's an environment which contains all of your software dependencies packaged up. And so if you wanted to reproduce um, a workflow, let's say, all you would need to do is install Docker and then get the Docker container that someone has for that workflow. And it's as easy as that. Then everything inside of it will work. Um, you don't need to install you don't need to worry about any Python libraries. You don't need to worry about any external C libraries or anything. It's, it's all, it all just works out of the box. Um, and it works on any operating system. So you can be on a Mac, you can be on Windows, you can be on Ubuntu or any Linux, um, and, it, and it will work out of the box. Um, so yeah, scientific work workflows are, as everyone has been saying in this in this uh, the last few days, they must be reproducible. Uh, I think the reasons uh, are quite clear by now. And this is more about just sharing your code. I think initially people say, oh, just make your code available. And that sort of ticks a box of reproducibility. And, and it really doesn't. Um, it, it should be about a lot more than that. Uh, it should be about sharing the whole infrastructure that enables a result to be obtained. Um, because something isn't reproducible if if you're having installation problems uh, or something works differently on a different operating system, um, which are things that you probably don't think about when you're developing your workflow. Um, you only become aware of those when someone else tries your workflow years later and then, then you discover the, the issues. Um, yeah, so reproducibility is, reproducibility is about having your your, your code, your software dependencies packaged together with clear documentation so that anyone can reproduce it using any uh, hardware or almost any hardware. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, yeah, and so containers provide a, a, a way to do this. Um, so that was my spiel on containers. I'm going to mention them uh, shortly again as well. Um, I want to talk about SKA science data challenges, because this is um, something that has helped us um, develop SRC uh, functionality. And the science data challenges that we've been doing, um, basically designed to represent the workflow of users interacting with SKA data products. So they're helping us test the functionality of SRCs. They're helping to uh, predict SKA capability through simulation and analysis. So we have to think about um, how we are creating these data products to represent what SKA data will look like and therefore how users will interact with it. Um, so the first data 
challenge that um, came out in uh, around about 2019, uh, uh, I think, if I remember that correctly. Um, it was a, an image so a source finding and image classification problem. So here's a little cutout from, from one of the images. Um, this is the 500 megahertz image. You can see some nice radio galaxies. Um, so <clears throat> SDC1 was a, a, a beginner, beginning data challenge to this. Uh, and there was an image they were at three frequency bands. And these images were 32,000 by 32,000 pixels. So they are very large. <laughs> um, and you've got hundreds of thousands of sources in them. And so the challenge was to find them and classify them. And then they were tested on how, how well they did. So how, how many sources did they find? Were their properties of those sources accurate? The flux density, the, the size, the shape, et cetera. Integrated flux density and peak as well. Um, so what we did is create a, so after this challenge, we created a workflow that tried to uh, be the best as we could, um, as we could make it in terms of uh, a showpiece for sort of a reproducible workflow um, that we've used in a number of examples that I'll come back to in a second. Um, so this workflow is, is shown on the right in this figure on the right here. So you've got images at various freq three frequencies, um, and then you have some uh, image preparation. So there was applying primary beams, uh, and then you've got some source finding going on, and then you've got some model fitting because this is a machine learning algorithm that uh, predicted the class of the source based on properties found from the source finder. Um, and then you've got, uh, yeah, that model was then applied to all of the sources in the field. Uh, and then you have, you, have, you have yourself a catalog and then that catalog was scored against the truth to compare how well your algorithm did um, and then you could continue this cycle tweaking parameters to improve it um, as you as you like. Um, so we made this solution in Python and we containerized it. We put it on GitHub and GitLab. Uh, we have the data sets on Zenodo um, and we've used it for, um, as an example, um, come up that slide in a second. We've used it as an example, um, which has been very useful in, in terms of training events that we'll come back to in just a second. Um, and then Science Data Challenge 2, I won't say too much about because I know Javier is speaking uh, late, I think it's tomorrow on this, on an example. So he'll be able to give you a, a more detailed example. But SDC2 involved analyzing a one terabyte in this queue. So I should say in, in SDC1, it was very much about users downloading their data and doing it on their laptop. Um, but in SDC2, um, we upped the data size to a terabyte. We tried to make it infeasible for people to, to do that. And we provided them with um, compute resources. Um, so a number of HPC providers helped us and users were able to do their computing at these centers um, to analyze this one terabyte image cube. Um, and, and this was deliberate uh, in trying to change the mindset of users to thinking about, okay, if I'm gonna interact with data, SKA data in the future, I'm going to need to do this kind of thing where I bring my code to the data that's hosted somewhere else. Um, yeah, so we had 40 teams in, uh, do this. Um, I will point out, and, and overall is a very positive experience. I will highlight some of the negative aspects in that um, there were there were teams that that wanted to use. There, there was a lot of wasted compute resource, let's say, from teams who wanted to do it but then didn't actually get around because this challenge was set over a six month period and so they would apply to use a compute resource at let's say iris or one of the other ones and then they didn't fully commit to it so for future future data challenges we're sorting we're sort of upping the uh, barrier for entry for people who are actually committed to use it when you're giving people access to um, hpc clusters, you really want to make sure that they are actually committed to using them rather than wasting that, that resource. Um, so future challenges will help test the functionality of SRCs through this way, um, both in terms of aligning um, users with this way of working and thinking, 
and to help us at SKA um, work out, uh, I guess, the limits of SKA data products and also uh, to build um, intuitive functionality within these regional centers. Um, one of the things that came out of Science Data Challenge 2 is, is we offered the chance for these reproducibility awards. Um, and this is up to users if they would like. So we didn't say you have to publish your code and data, but we said, we'll give you a, a token award and mention you in, in the paper. Uh, so the paper for this is coming out um, shortly. Um, yeah, we'll mention you and, and sort of how well. Um, and only six of the 40 teams actually submitted um, to, to, to be assessed for one of these awards, which is a good start. Um, but these are some of the, these, this is not an exclusive list of what we defined as reproducibility, but this is something we came up with as a starting point. Um, and some of the, you know, is it well documented? Is your, is your software easy to install, easy to use? Does it have a license? Um, is the code accessible? Have you followed coding standards? Do you have modules um, and classes involved? And do you have any unit tests and things like that? So we went through the six that did submit their results and we tried to reproduce their result and then give them sort of a score on that. Um, so we got some nice feedback on that and hopefully we, for, for future data challenges, we're, we're gonna keep ringing this bell, let's say, and, and we're gonna keep trying to get users to um, think about um, if they're gonna participate in the challenge, can they, can they back it up by um, showing how they can make the result reproducible? So um, yeah, towards full reproducibility, I think I've mentioned these things already. Um, it's about, yeah, things like style guide documentation. Um, I think things that all in this, in this uh, conference we're all very aware of. Um, and like I was saying before, it's, it's about um, this full reproducibility is about linking your code and your data and your software environment um, for that. And then lastly, um, I think I've just got two slides left, um, something on training events. Uh, so we are we, we have run a training event um, as of this year and we'll be looking at running more training events and these are specifically training events looking at technologies that support the kind of workflows that are going to be run at regional centers on SKA data and of course we we are taking it from an SKA angle but I think this is generic to any sort of big data research Technologies like Docker Singularity, those containers, um, GitHub, um, your best practices in coding, how you develop pipelines, um, how you use uh, remote computing infrastructures, um, even things like how you use GPUs and how you implement maybe some uh, popular tools like machine learning, um, machine learning tools. So our first event was fully virtual earlier this year at the end of January and February uh, and beginning of February. And the way we did it was, so we had um, uh, two mornings, so it was basically two Mondays and the mornings were, were packed with the talk. So 9, 9 a.m. till lunch, we had these interactive you know, the basics of containers um, and some tutorials and then some hands-on assignments. And then basically people would go away for the week and try out these things themselves and then the next Monday we would regroup and then um, uh, do slightly more advanced things. Um, so we had very much, very positive feedback from that. Um, we, so yeah, we had 100, 120 participants. I think we had about three to 400 registrations. So we were, we were very overwhelmed with the demand for such things. Um, and so if, if any of you would like to rewatch this, the link is at the top there. <clears throat> Um, it was all recorded. Uh, yeah, and we're hoping to build on this. This was very much basics from the beginning. And we're hoping to build on this to do more intermediate advanced things with some of those technologies I've highlighted. And this is um, just the GitLab repository for the solution, the SDC one solution, because we use that Science Data Challenge one solution as, a, as an example. So we got people to basically reproduce the solution that we'd, we'd had. Um, by yeah, going through 
uh, the Git um, getting the container and, and deploying it on their own system. Um, with the caveat that we had to make sure that um, because people were deploying it on their own laptops and such, laptops have limits with regards to how much RAM they have and how good the CPUs are. So we did have to think about, um, you know, if, if people are going to reproduce their workflow, are there options in terms of tweaking how it runs to take into account uh, computers with less RAM, let's say, which turned out to be incredibly important for this because the, these images are so large that you need uh, quite a lot of RAM to actually make this workflow run. Um, uh, yeah, so, and then, yeah, so we run these as part of the Science User Engagement Working Group at SKA, and we're aiming to lead more such events, as I say, to encourage the best practices and research and helping to broaden user skills to maximize the impact of SKA. Yeah. So my last slide here, just as a quick summary, um, SKA regional centers will be the point of access for SKA data. Um, uh, and 2028 is the current date for when SKAO becomes online, ready to go. Um, we're using data challenges and training events as part of testing SRC functionality and user engagement. We want to learn how users will be interacting with data products and make sure they're getting the best experience um, out of that. And we want to encourage users to adopt best practices when doing their research and make these are the, the default way of working, which is why we're starting to do these things now because uh, obviously it takes years to, to align um, how people work um, for when it comes online. Yeah, and then just overall, really trying to maximize the impact of the research that comes out of SKEO, um, as I alluded to with um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Hubble Telescope. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Alex, for this uh, nice talk. Uh, we have some questions on Slack uh, and or questions and comments actually. And uh, Oshin is asking, uh, um, and I think this is in the context of the uh, the data volume and how uh, expensive it is to store it all, and that there won't be any mirrors and so on. He's asking whether there is any way to access very short samples of the raw data from the SK for some specific purposes. And he's given the example of uh, a few seconds of a raw LOVAR data to get some uh, very interesting results on transient events. Are there any plans for, for doing that? Um, yeah, I, I see the, the, the reason for asking that. So initially, no, um, it, it really is a hard, um, the visibilities are literally deleted um, within a few days of them coming out after the, after the data products have been formed. There are very, very specific use cases. Um, the two I have in mind are the epoch re reionization and perhaps some transient pulsar work. Um, I can't comment on how specific those will be, but um, gen generally the answer is no. <laughs> um, of course, there will be a there will be a lot of prototyping leading up to before 2028. You know, with some test observations and such. Um, but in terms of full operation, um, it simply is, is infeasible to have access to the visibilities, apart from some very, very specific use cases, which I, I can't really comment on right now. Okay, thank you. And then there were some uh, comments. Uh, Mohammed is saying that Singularity is now called Aptainer, and he's providing a link to the community announcement for that. Oh, nice. And uh, finally, referring back to the previous talk, Janet is uh, um, uh, commenting on the VOSI uh, table standard. And uh, she's, provided, she's provided a link uh, to that as well. So uh, just for uh, everyone's information. And I think that brings us to the end of, uh, of this session. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, for your presentation and all the speakers this morning. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not really morning anymore, but anyway, uh, we now have a half an hour break until half past the hour, and then we continue with the second session for today. <laughs>